Welcome to the class on Romans, everyone. Shalom. And um, also welcome to our e-learning students who will be listening to this uh, lecture later on. Um, last week, we were uh, studying chapter 6. Uh, we'll continue our study of uh, chapter 6, and then we'll move on to uh, chapter 7 today. So before we continue looking at chapter 6, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Yeah, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. God, uh, as we are about to learn uh, the spiritual truths that can transform our life, Jesus, God, I just pray that we'll open our mind and heart, our spiritual eyes and ears will be opened so that we can understand it, so that we can uh, receive it in our heart we can be fully convinced in our faith that these are the truths that i should walk in my life jesus but i just pray for all my classmates who are about to come who's over here give us good wi-fi connection throughout the session so that nothing will be a distraction to us we give pastor selena into your hands we bless her in the name of jesus right now as she's preaching to us be with her guide us jesus let this class be done for your glory let this class be the class where we learn more about you where we understand more about you where we rejoice in our spirit uh, by knowing who you are by knowing who we are in you jesus we give you all the glory and honor in jesus name we pray amen, amen. so uh, we began looking at uh, romans chapter 6 verse 15 where in verse 15 we see that you know paul uh, mentions the second rhetorical question, the second main question here he says, shall we sin because we're not under the law but under the under grace, which he uh, says this in, 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 in verse 15. And then he has two other uh, questions uh, to uh, help answer this main question, which is in verse 16 and verse 21. And we see that he answers this quest, this main question, you know, um, shall we continue to sin because we're not under law but under grace? He says, says certainly uh, not. Um, and he says, why? Because, you know, he says that uh, he's already told us that we need to present ourselves to uh, God. We need to submit ourselves as slaves to um, righteousness uh, because and uh, not slaves to sin, because we're not no longer under the law, but under um, grace. Okay, so we looked at um, all of those verses, and uh, we uh, we came to verse nineteen, where uh, verses nineteen to twenty three, we see that you know Paul basically is summing up what he's saying, uh, but he uh, even as he sums up what he's been talking about uh, so far, he recognizes a problem that believers can still have, uh, which he deals with in uh, verses nineteen to twenty three. So he says that hey, we are dead to sin; sin has no longer control over us. You know, um, so you know because we're dead to sin, you know we no longer need, uh, can continue sinning sin has no control over our lives and he's mentioned all of that but then even as he you know uh, he sums up the entire thing he recognizes hey there is a problem that uh, believers uh, or you and i can still have and what is that that is the weakness uh, of our uh, flesh so uh, he talks about that in verses 19 to verses 23. So we'll, we'll study verses 19 to verses 23 now. Can, uh, can one of you please read verses 19 to 23, please? Chapter 6. Yes, Romans chapter 6, verses 19 to 23. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. 
what fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed for the end of those things is death but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of god you have your fruit of you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life for the wages of sin is death but the gift of god is eternal life in christ jesus our lord amen thank you roslin so here he begins this um, verse by saying i speak in human terms which means paul is using a language that they are able to understand and and he's basically referring to the use using of an example regarding slaves so you know slave slavery was very well known very familiar uh, in the roman world in the roman empire and uh, so he's using um, uh, he, you know an example from uh, 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 an example that is very familiar to them and he says you know as we apply this this whole truth of identification to overcome sin which he has discussed at length in chapters 5 and 6 you know he says we are going to walk in holiness okay so this is what paul is getting to but he's saying that you know we are going to walk in holiness but even as we are getting to that there is one problem and that problem is the weakness of our flesh now the word flesh has different meanings uh, in the new testament it means uh, the body it also means the the sinful evil desires of the outer man which is the body and the flesh but the flesh here means the natural evil desires of the uh, body okay uh, paul also writes in galatians chapter 5 where he writes about the works of the flesh and he lists out all the evil desires of the the flesh which is the body and here he says there is the weakness of the flesh and uh, he will elaborate or he'll talk more about this uh, on this in uh, chapter 7 but how do we get rid of the weakness of our flesh where sin has a strong grip or a strong hold on us for a long time so he says you know how do you get rid of the weakness of your flesh he says you need to present your members you know he's already spoken about uh, this and he says all this happens as an act of our will and uh, uh, and he repeats the idea of willfully you know presenting or yielding ourselves as slaves so in verse 6 he's already spoken about this in verse 16 where he says you present yourselves as slaves to obey and verse 19 where he says now present your members as slaves of righteousness to um holiness or slaves of righteousness for holiness so before you know they were born again um uh you know paul says that they con- they were continually presenting their members as slaves of uncleanliness or slaves of impurity and lawlessness which means a wickedness or transgression or they were basically violating the law which was leading to more lawlessness but now since they are in Christ he says now you know you need to present your members as slaves of righteousness and what is it going to yield slaves of righteousness for holiness so before you were born again you were presenting your members as slaves of uncleanliness but he says now since you are in Christ you are to present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness and paul reminds them that when they were in sin you know the end result of that was death okay and he's he's mentioning this in verse 21 and he says in verse 23 that the wages of sin is uh, death however when we yield ourselves as slaves to god and as slaves to righteousness uh, we have the fruit of holiness what uh, this is what he says in verses 19 and 22 where he says this leads eventually to eternal life and so he's saying that god's grace has made us free from sin and in response to god's grace 
you know what is should what should be our response to god's grace we must uh, you know we willingly must make ourselves slaves um, to god and slaves to righteousness and what does that yield or what is the end result of us willingly making that choice of submitting and surrendering ourselves as slaves to god and as slaves to righteousness the result is holy living before uh, god okay so in chapter seven uh, you know the whole discussion is the, he's going to elaborate uh, more about the weakness of the flesh he's going to be talking about the struggle of a man who has the law of god and he wants to obey god but he doesn't have the power to do it because of the weakness of the flesh and then he explains um, uh, why the flesh is weakened in chapter 7 and in chapter 8 he he goes on to say that you know for those who are born again those who are believers uh, this is the answer it is the work of the holy spirit that is going to help them to overcome the weakness in the uh, flesh and so he says you know yes i know that there is the weakness of the flesh but there is a law and what is that law? It's not the, the commandments or the Torah, but here he's saying the law of the spirit of life. Uh, and he says the law of the spirit of life, which is the Holy Spirit, will help us to conquer the weaknesses in the flesh, which will help us to overcome the weaknesses of the flesh. And um, so, you know, he goes on to talk about uh, in, in chapter 8, uh, where how the believer can live that victorious life. Okay, so he ends with just talking about uh, in this part of his letter, talking about the weakness of the flesh, but he goes on to, you know, elaborate that in chapter 7. And uh, in chapter 8, he, he helps us how you know, we can um, live a victorious life over this weakness of the flesh uh, when we uh, follow the law of the spirit of life or the Holy Spirit that helps us to conquer the flesh. Okay. So that is uh, chapter six. Um, when we move on to chapter seven, we'll understand more because this is the letter, it's a flow, there's a connect. Anyone has any questions in chapter six? Before we move on to chapter seven, no questions. Okay, thank you, Jeffina. Anyone else? Okay, if there are no questions, then we'll move on to chapter seven. Uh, I like for us to read through chapter seven so that we can understand, you know, uh, the background the introduction that I'm going to give you, a short brief of uh, chapter 7. So it's good for us to read it before we understand in totality what he's trying to really uh, talk about in chapter 7. So there are 25 um, um, verses, and I think uh, there are nine of us, uh, uh, sorry, eight of you all. So, so each of you can read uh, maybe three or four verses, please, and then we can move on. Uh, can each of you read three or four verses from Romans chapter 7? Or those of you who want to read can also go ahead and read more than four or five verses. Yeah. This one, uh, chapter 7. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. Can someone else read verses 5 onwards, please? 
for when we were in the flesh the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death but now we have been delivered from the law having died to what we were held by so that we should serve in the new newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter what shall we say then is the law sin certainly not on the contrary i would not have known sin except through the law for i would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet but sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire for apart from the law sin was dead i mean thank you subhashish can someone else read verses 9 onwards please i was alive once without the law but when the commandment came sin revived and i died and the commandment which was to bring life i found to bring death for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it killed me yes go ahead linden therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good you can read 13 and 14 as well please how then what has then what is good become death to me certainly not but sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful for we know that the law is spiritual but i am carnal sold under sin amen thank you linden can someone else read uh, verses 15 onwards please for what i am doing i do not understand for what i will uh, for what i will to do that i do not practice but what i hate that i do if then i do what i will not to do i agree with the law that it is good but now it is no longer i who do it but sin that dwells in me for i know that in me that is in my flesh nothing good dwells for to will is present with me but now to perform what is good i do not find for the good that i will to do i do not do but evil i will not to do that i practice now if i do what i will not to do it is no longer i, I who do it but sin that dwells in me i find then a law that evil is present with me that one who wills to do good for i delight in the law of god according to the inward man but i see another law in my members wearing against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members okay thank you uh, uh zalatoli just two more verses anyone would like to read the two verses the wretched man that i am who will deliver me from this body of death i thank god through jesus christ our lord so then with the mind i myself serve the law of god but with the flesh the law of sin amen, amen. thank you so uh, in chapter 6 uh, we see that you know paul has established that um, we have been um, justified freely by the grace of god we have been made righteous in god's sight and are in a standing of uh, grace and then he says uh, you know uh, he then goes on to say then do we live um, uh, victorious he then goes on to say how we can live victorious over uh, sin and in chapter 6 paul also presents to us uh, the truth of identification and that through our identification uh, with christ uh, in his uh, death the old man has been crucified and the power of sin over our lives has been broken uh, so we no longer have a sinful nature that is in our inner person which is exerting its influence inside out and this is a spiritual reality 
or what he refers to as the positional truth that we have in Christ. And then he goes on to explain in chapter 6, you know, the various uh, practical actions uh, that we need to uh, that we need to take to walk experientially in this uh, spiritual reality that we have in Christ. Now in chapter 7, uh, you know, uh, chapter 7 has been quite a challenging chapter for those who study the Bible because um, Paul refers uh, to himself as I in several places. If you, uh, you know, while reading, if you have noticed, there are several places in this chapter where he refers uh, to himself as I. And uh, it's not clear for people who are studying, uh, you know, the scriptures, whether he's talking about himself before he was saved or he's talking about himself after he was saved. So the whole uh, problem they have is uh, when reading chapter 7 is is Paul writing this in uh, in a place where or he's referring to himself uh, uh, before he was born again or before he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus or was it after he was um, saved? So they're not very, very clear about it. Uh, so it's not clear whether he was talking about himself as being saved and struggling in the flesh or where was Paul in his spiritual journey as he refers to himself in Romans uh, chapter 7. So this is the big question mark. Now, um, when we read uh, different Christian books, um, the authors would, you know, explain from their own perspective, um, you know, based on a, a presumption of a certain position or a certain stand uh, that they're taking. Uh, so some people say that Paul is talking about himself as a new believer and he's struggling with the, this whole thing about the weakness in the flesh. Or some people say that Paul is talking about his life, about the life of every believer on this earth. Um, you know, uh, as they even if, uh, even after they're born again, they're still struggling with the flesh. Um, so this could be another position that people could take. But um, what they're basically trying to say is that you know, if you are a believer, uh, you know, for the rest of your life, you are going to be struggling with sin. So if they take this position or they take the stand that hey, well, Paul, when he's mentioning about himself here in chapter seven, he's basically basically mentioning about himself after he's born again and how he is or. Uh, he's talking about himself as a believer and how he's struggling with the uh, the flesh or if he's or if they're trying to take this position that you know that all believers for the rest of their life are going to struggle uh, with sin you know uh, uh, or they're mentioning this as uh, you know in in chapter 7 they're talking about believers who are trying to struggle with sin even after they have been um, born again, what they're basically trying to say is, you know, you and I as believers for the rest of our lives, we are going to struggle with this whole aspect of uh, sin. But the point of view that um, we like to share is, you know, um, and we're not going to be forcing this idea upon any of you. We are convinced that from Romans 7, even as we read it, you know, uh, you can read it for yourself and you can make your own decision, whatever you want to make. But we are convinced that Paul is talking about himself when he was an unsaved person, uh, when he was under the law. And he's talking about his struggles as a good man who is still unsaved, who is living under the law. Uh, but when we move on to Romans 8, he's talking about, uh, you know, uh, salvation and the life in Christ. So in our understanding, as we read Romans 7, um, what has been said does not apply to a believer. It applies to somebody, in this case, you know, Paul, it applies to Paul who was not yet saved, but yet he was a good man who was living under the law. And it's showing the struggle of any person who's trying to live right, but does not have the life of God in him or does not have the power of the Holy Spirit in him 
and who's trying to live a good life, who's trying to keep the law, but at constantly at different points is seeing themselves as people who are unable to keep the law, unable to, uh, you know, uh, follow the law and always breaking the law. Why? Because they do not have the power of the Holy Spirit in them. So this is how we understand Romans uh, chapter 7. And I wanted us to be aware of the different uh, uh, stands that people have, different uh, stands that Bible teachers have and how they see it uh, differently. Uh, while it's quite clear for us uh, that Paul is referring to himself in Romans chapter 7 while he is under the uh, law. Now, some people may say it's a struggle of every believer throughout their life that, you know, sin is a struggle for every believer throughout their lives. Um, we don't think this is right because of what Paul has already mentioned in Romans chapter 6. Now, why we are taking a stand that uh, chapter 7 is not what Paul is saying when after he becomes a believer that he's going to struggle with uh, sin, but it's he's talking about himself as an unbeliever or before he was saved uh, is what is mentioned in Romans chapter 7 because of what he's already spoken to us in Romans chapter 6. Now, what has he told us in Romans chapter 6? In Romans chapter 6, he tells us the power of sin is already broken over our lives that sin has no longer any dominion over us sin has no longer any um power or authority the power of sin uh, um, and the authority of sin the dominion of sin over our lives is broken is nullified we are dead to uh, sin and that is what he has already spoken of in chapter six he's already given us the truth of our identification he's already given us our positional a truth or our positional identification of who we are in Christ. And so what is mentioned in Romans chapter 7 cannot be an experience of a believer for the rest of their um, lives. But it is uh, 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 an experience of a person who is under the law and not under the power of the Holy Spirit but a person who's under the law, who has a good heart, who wants to do good things, but cannot do it because they are not under the power of the Holy um, Spirit. So in chapter 7, uh, Paul talks about the law uh, in certain places. When he talks about the law, he's basically referring to the Old Testament law, but he also uses uh, the word law in the context of um, sin, which means the law of sin. When he says the law of sin, he's basically saying the, uh, the uh, sin that controls us or has dominion over us. So when he talks about the law of sin in that context, he's not talking about the the Old Testament law, but he's talking about the dominion of sin or the control of sin. So when he talks about the law of death, he's talking about the control or the dominion of death. When he talks about the law of life, he's talking about the control or dominion about life. When he's talking about the law of the Holy Spirit, he's talking about the control or dominion of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, we need to understand these two different um, contexts in which law is used. So in some places law is used in the context of which it refers to the Old Testament law but in the other places when he talks about the law of life the law of sin the law of death the law of um, the Holy Spirit he's basically talking about the control the dominion the authority the power of sin death or the Holy Spirit um, uh, that uh, you know um, uh, that is over us. So in this chapter, uh, Paul reveals that just as a believer is uh, dead to sin, the believer is also dead to the law and is therefore free from the law. However, this does not mean that the law is sinful or the law is evil in itself. Well, the law is good. Uh, it, the law served its purpose. The law served its purpose in the sense that the law made us aware of sin. The more that we have been made aware of sin, the more, he says, we want to break it. And why do we want to break it? Because he says, sin dwells in me, in my flesh. There is no good thing. The law of sin is working in my flesh. So here again, 
the law of sin means the control, the dominion, the power of sin is working in my flesh. Sin is a law, which means sin is has control, has power, has dominion, and is now controlling my body. Uh, so the real problem here is not the law, but uh, the real problem is that sin uh, that rules and dominates the flesh and the members of our uh, body. Uh, the law required people uh, to do things. Now, when you talk about the law required people, we're talking about the Old Testament law. The law required people to do things in the strength of their own flesh, which was impossible because sin already dominated the flesh. Uh, so he says sin was accentuated uh, or sin was made more noticeable by the law and only further exposed the weakness of the uh, flesh. Okay, But Paul then highlights the struggle we face um, in the flesh where sin was has dominated our flesh for so long. And then he prepares us for the truth that he's going to reveal to us in chapter 8 on how we can overcome uh, the law of sin and death that works in our flesh. Uh, and he says we can overcome the law of sin and death that works in our flesh through the power of the Holy Spirit. So uh, this is um, an overview of what this chapter is all about. And we will study this chapter in detail. Um, and then you will be able to understand it more. Before we begin, is there any questions anyone has? Any doubts? Anything that you'd like to ask? No? OK, if not, we will um, move on to verses um, 1 to 6. Uh, where Paul talks about how we are dead to the law and uh, he uses the example of uh, how, you know, uh, the, of marriage and how we are married to uh, Christ. Okay. So Paul in these verses is specifically speaking to Jewish believers, uh, those who are familiar with the law, which is the law of Moses. And why Jews? Because, uh, you know, they had the law and hence he's not speaking here to the Gentiles or he's not referring to the Gentiles. Um, why do we say that he's talking to Jewish believers? Because he calls them as uh, brethren. He says, or oh, do you not know brethren? Okay. So he's talking about life before and um, you know, and uh, and after they are in Christ, and how their life was changed before. You know, they were Jewish brethren; they were under the law, and now he's impressing upon them or helping them to understand that they are free from the uh, law. Now, to help them to understand uh, this, he's using an analogy of a wife. Uh, as a wife, you know, by law she is bound to a husband. But if her husband dies, uh, she is free to marry anyone else, or she's free to marry someone else. And he's saying, uh, brethren, I want you to know, you know, uh, what does he want them to know? Verse 4, he says, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to uh, God. So he's saying, uh, you know, uh, I want you to know, brethren, that you have been dead to the law through our identification with Christ or through us being in Christ. So he's saying that, you know, the shift has uh, taken place. Um, they were once outside the body of Christ, but now they are in the body of Christ. They are in Christ. And he says when they were outside the body of Christ, they were under the law, but now, uh, since they are in the body of Christ, he uses the phrase, you are married to an other. Now, he's saying, now that you are in the body of Christ, he uses a phrase to um, identify that they are part of the body of Christ. He says, now you are married to someone else, you are married to another, uh, because the law is dead. Okay, And as far as believer is concerned, the law is dead. It is um, 
it's over it is uh, done with it is gone and he says now they are part of christ they are in christ they are part of the body of christ and they are married to christ married to christ means he's talking about spiritual unity how they are spiritually united he's talking about our spiritual identification with christ so when he's saying that they are married uh, uh, to Christ, he's talking about how they are spiritually united with Christ. In verses 5 and 6, he says, when we were in the flesh, which means when they are where they were not believers, but they were living in the past sinful life, he says, the sinful passions aroused by the law, means the sinful passions were, you know, highlighted by the law. It means that it was the law that said do not steal it was a law that said do not kill it was a law that said do not commit adultery do not covet uh, if there was uh, no law then you know these passions these sinful passions would look very noble it would look like hey this is part of life this is how we are supposed to live this is what everyone is doing uh, this is what i'm also doing and this is what also what i also think that i should be doing but, you know, but these things, when seen in the light of the law, uh, they realize that it is wrong. It, other people could do it. Other people can do it. But because they are chosen by God, because they have been given the law, they know that these things, which would look at as normal passions, are actually wrong. So these sinful, he says, these sinful passions worked in our members which means it worked in our body it worked in our flesh and what was the end result of this workings of these sinful passions he's saying it resulted only in death okay verse six he says but now we have been delivered from the law he says when we were under the law without christ we were living bound by all of these sinful passions uh, that were highlighted by the law. But now, since we have been delivered from the law, um, and now that we are in the body of Christ, you know, we are living in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Okay, so he's basically contrasting two lives, life under the letter of the law, which he refers to as the oldness of the letter. And the, the life that is in the newness of the spirit, the life that is under the law and the life in the spirit. So when I say law means under the control, the power, the dominion, the authority uh, uh, of the life in the spirit. And he's talking about this newness of the spirit as something that we are married to in Christ, which means we have our spiritual union, we're spiritually united with Christ. Um, um, which um, also refers to us, uh, also refers as the newness of the uh, spirit. So the main point in um, this, uh, the, these six verses, he's, he's getting at the Jewish believers and he's trying to get them to understand that, you know, they are, that they as Jewish believers are no longer under the law anymore, that they are free from the law because now, they are uh, part of the body of Christ. They are in Christ. And he says, we are serving God in the newness of the uh, spirit. Okay. A cross reference that we can look at is Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. So if you could please turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. And can somebody read that please for us? Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. Galatians chapter 5 verse 18 but if you are led by the spirits you are not under the law amen so he says if you are led by the spirit you are not under the law why because it's the holy spirit is going to help us to keep the law and much more than the law it's the Holy Spirit who's going to help us to bear the fruit of the Spirit. And he says, against this, there is no law, which means the law cannot 
hold uh, us against this. So when we walk in the spirit, you know, we are no longer under the law. And hence, in Romans chapter, uh, uh, you know, um, 7 verse 6, he says, we are in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter of the law. He's telling the Jewish believers, you don't have to live under the law anymore. Okay, because now you are in Christ, you are part of the body of Christ, and you are under the law of the Holy Spirit or under the control and the dominion of the Holy Spirit. And hence, you don't have to live under the law. And then he goes on to talk about the law and the struggle with sin in uh, verses uh, 7 to 12. So before we move from uh, on to verses 7 to 12, anyone has any questions? No so basically, okay, thank you, Rosalind. So basically, in in these verses, he's talking about is the law bad? So verse seven, he says, "What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet.'" But sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So in these verses, Paul is addressing the whole aspect um, of the law. He has just told the Jewish believers that we are not under the law, that they are free from the law, that they are in the body of Christ. They are married, uh, spiritually united to Christ uh, and to one another, and they are serving God in the newness of the spirit. And now he uh, he mentions or he uh, writes a rhetorical question, and he says, is the law sinful? Which means, is there a problem with the law? And he says, certainly not. The problem is not with the law. And as he concludes in verse 12, where he says, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just and good. So he says the problem is not the law. The problem is because of the law, sin became very, very powerful, which means I now know that there was something called sin. And then I realized that I couldn't be free from this sin, from this thing called sin. Uh, so the law basically highlighted my weakness against sin. The law basically. Um, highlighted that I cannot keep the law, I cannot overcome a sin, that, uh, you know, it highlighted my weakness against sin. So in this passage, you know, um, there's something very interesting in verse 9, Paul says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died, okay? It's a very challenging verse for many to understand what Paul is trying to say when he says, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So in this verse, Paul is referring to himself. Uh, when was Paul in the state? Uh, and how do we understand this verse correctly uh, to the best of our understanding? Uh, so the best person to ask is Apostle Paul. Uh, but since he is not here himself, you know, we have the Holy Spirit who can help us. So when he says that he was without the law or he did not have an, uh, or he did not have an understanding of the law, he's saying that he did not have an understanding of what is good and bad, or he did not have an understanding of what is right and wrong, and hence he did not know what he had to submit to. Sorry. So he's saying when he was without the law, or he did not, he's basically saying that 
without the law means he's saying he did not have an understanding of the law. He did not have an understanding of what is good and bad or what is right and wrong. And he did not know what he had to um, submit to. So, you know, that's, that's what he's trying to say. And I'd like to share something as though, you know, um, uh, this is definitive, but this is indicative. Now, for example, at the age of 12, you know, um, uh, you know, just imagine people understand commandments. Uh, children know what is right and wrong. But at the age of 12, you know, they come to a place of accountability. Okay, they come to a place where they're able to see the big picture. They're able to see that hey, there is God, it's not just about, you know, it's not just about doing right and wrong, it's not just about obeying uh, dad or mom, or, you know, it's not just about, hey, if I do something right, then I get a reward, I get some uh, chocolates, or I get some perks, or I get uh, the opportunity to watch uh, TV, or if they do something wrong, they know that they don't get a reward. Okay, now they come to a place where, uh, you know, when they're, uh, you know, 12 years of age and past that, they come to a place where they've understood the commandment as having to do with God. Okay, it's not finally about what is right and what is wrong. It's not about, hey, I do something right and I, I get a reward for it, or I do something wrong and I don't get a reward for it. But they come to a place where they've understood the commandment as having to do with their relationship with God. And what is that exact age? That age varies most probably, say, you know, 12 or 13 and above. So what Paul is basically saying in verse 9 is when Paul came to an understanding of the law, which means he knew he was accountable to the standard of the law, or he came to a place where he understood the commandment as having to do with God. He says, you know, sin revived and I died, which means there was no way uh, to overcome sin. Uh, sin took a hold of him. He says, I died means sin brought about decay. Sin also brought about corruption and, uh, you know, kind of destroyed his um, life. So he's basically saying that, you know, yes, the law was there, the commandments were there, but, you know, uh, we just we just did it because, you know, whether it we, you know, you, you do something right, you, you, uh, you get the uh, the blessings, you do something wrong, you get the rewards. But, you know, you come to an age where, you know, that uh, rewards is no longer the main objective of doing uh, right. And, uh, you know, uh, not getting a reward is the whole uh, purpose of doing something wrong. But you come to an age where you come to a place of accountability, where you're able to see a bigger picture that, hey, it's not just about right and wrong, but you're accountable to God. You're doing this because uh, you want uh, it's honoring in God's sight. This is what he wants us uh, uh, to do. So you're understanding the whole context of the law having to do with God. And he says when he came to that whole understanding, then sin revived and I died, which means there was no way to overcome sin because, you know, sin was already... Uh, so much part of um, uh, the, uh, uh, their natural self because they were uh, under the uh, uh, the first Adam, uh, you know, they were under sin. Sin had a control over their lives and, uh, you know, sin had uh, uh, control over them. And he says, you know, I died. So when they realized that uh, they were sinning that sin had so much control over their lives and also saw you know that he when he says i died he's basically saying that you no know, sin brought decay and sin also brought corruption and uh, destroys um, our life okay sorry i'll stop here i've um, gone past time um, we'll stop here and we'll continue on friday and we'll try to understand this uh, in a more uh, deeper sense okay uh, any questions anyone ha has? Uh
verses 1 to verse 8. Maybe I can explain verse 9 in more detail, more better next time. Anyone has any questions, any doubts? No? Okay. If there are no questions, any doubts, so we'll end class. Thank you, everyone, for uh, uh, joining class. Uh, we we'll look at this more in detail on Friday. Have a blessed week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.